Hello and good afternoon and welcome to our webinar this afternoon, The Difference Between Backup and Archive. My name is Duncan Beattie, I'm the CSO for GB Labs and I'm joined today by Matt Scott, who is from my US office and over here in the UK with me. Good afternoon, Matt. Good afternoon, Duncan. Thanks for having us and good morning to everyone in the United States. Excellent. So today we are going to be talking about backup and archive and going through the key differences between the two and also why they're so important to our customers, why they're so important to our partners and also to the storage environment. Um, this is a very key topic and we want to do to dedicate a webinar to this um, to, to discuss about the key differences and also that software level, what we can do and how we can keep your data safe. So before we go into it, I'm just going to go through a little bit of history about the company. Actually, just before I start, if I can just say on the panel on your right hand side, there is a, uh, a questions option. So if you have any questions, please type them in there and then we'll cover that off at the end. Um, so if you ask them halfway through, we will cover that off at the end and look forward to having a discussion then. So back up an archive. So just to give you a little bit of history about us, most of you know GB Labs as creating some incredibly powerful and scalable storage solutions. Um, however, the software that sits inside those, uh, inside those boxes has been developed over the years as well. Um, and most recently, we've made some major additions. In 2009, we launched Core OS, our core operating system. And within that, we had our initial space system. This is an online storage, very fast, NAS-based media storage system. And at the time, we had quite a lot of people backing those up to other storage devices. And what we found is that the software they were using was just really quite inadequate in getting that data off safely and quickly and, and actually being usable. So we developed replication and introduced that into our core OS, and that allowed us to produce the product that we know as Echo. This was great because it gave us our own hardware to work with. We could guarantee performance to people when they needed it. And it was a really, really big success. And we sell a lot of Echo, and we still do so. In 2012, we were asked to develop the LTO side of our product. And at that point, we introduced Tape Manager inside our Vault systems. And this was for archive and backup in later years with the Tape Manager and the data, the data, the data safety tools. In 2014, we introduced our cloud integration. And back then, we introduced it with AWS, amongst other, a couple of other providers. And we also do, introduced automation into our software. This was key because this is working very well with the Echo, the replication tools, the tape, and the cloud. In 2016, we added in disk snapshots. Again, another great tool for keeping your data safe. In 2018, we introduced Cloak DR. This is for our instant backup or failover solutions. So as data is being written, it's been written to two locations simultaneously. And of course, in 2020 and now 2021, we've had Unify Hub taking that original integration of cloud in 2014 and taking it to the next level with some fantastic home working options and cloud integration and cloud sharing and acceleration. So that gives you a little bit of history of what we produce. As we move towards the next part of the presentation. So backup and archive, what are the major differences? Um, having been in the industry a long, long time and had many discussions with people, I've always wanted to make sure that we clarify the difference between backup and archive because they do very, very different roles. A backup is a copy. It's taking your live work, your um, expensive work, and making a second or third or fourth copy depending on how many you want. It's there to help you get out of those horrible moments when something gets lost. Alternatively, an archive is a move of data. We're taking data from your current work, your live environment, your completed projects, perhaps your ingested media or your raw media, and we're archiving it, putting it onto safe storage somewhere else. So I'm gonna cover backup in a minute, and then Matt's gonna come through and cover the archive part of the software and the workflows. So backup, what is it for? Well, as I just mentioned, it's about making a copy of your important data or multiple copies. What does it protect? Your work in progress, your live data, your rushes, your dailies, your media. Anything that has not yet been delivered needs to be backed up. 
It's imperative that you do this to keep your data safe, to protect your workflow and your investment. What sort of locations do we have for this backup? Traditionally, disk, tape, and cloud. Now Matt's gonna go through these later on, but from an archive point of view, which is slightly different from backup point of view because the, the workflow is different. Now disk locations can be a portable drive on the desktop. They could be another NAS, another server, another GB Lab server, another storage volume completely. It doesn't really matter too much as long as you're keeping your data safe. But as we go through and talk about the workflow and the pros and cons later, you'll understand why choosing the right form of the disk backup is incredibly important. Tape systems, AIT in older years and now LTO, LTO 8 and LTO 9 around the corner. Again, a very effective way of backing up and very traditional. Tape has been used for a long time to try and mimic the old way of backing up media. Of course, now that we're in a tapeless workflow, backing up these files is incredibly important. And the amount of files that get generated is huge compared to the old tape workflow. So in an old tape environment, backing up your media was putting the tape on a shelf and keeping it there until you delivered. And we need to kind of replicate that. And now, of course, we have cloud. That cloud integration, allowing you to put these files onto the cloud on someone else's storage somewhere else, but having access to it. And it has introduced some great flexibility because tape is quite a, quite a manual um, quite a manual thing to be able to manage, unless of course you have a robot and a large library. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the traditional workflows and then the pros and cons of those. And this will probably be familiar to quite a few of our, our, um, our customers watching this. So let's start with the traditional disk to tape. So you have your storage system and you have a tape drive. Now, when you're not producing huge amounts of data, this is pretty useful. Um, you take your tape and every night on a schedule, you'd back up to your tape, your live work. So it would take across a copy of your live projects. You can put a tape system in and you can back up your media, your dailies, your rushes, your raw media onto those tapes and keep them safely as well. More recently, this has been replaced by cloud because it's easy. However, what you have there is you have a limitation on speed. Now, if you're backing up to tape, you can back up at around 300 megabytes a second, as long as the software supports that. Whereas cloud is gonna be a lot slower. It can be a lot easier, but it's a lot slower. And of course, tape has the advantage of having potentially, certainly with our vault system, you've got sort of clip previews. Um, we have integration with things like Archiware. Uh, with their p5 plugin so that's of course using tape um, you've got different other tape system with perhaps large robots so they're very traditional and then we have disk now this to disk backup is advantageous in many ways the first of all is of course you've got a very very quick process to get your data from your online to your near line your disk backup this is great because um, certainly with our Echo range of products, our Echo is fast enough to work from, for example. But you could use um, a standard sort of IT-based NAS. You might not be able to work from it, but at least you get a copy. And that's important to back up. You know, it's, we're really pushing how important this is. So now we can add disk to disk to tape. So people are using a disk-based system to do the initial backup and then pushing to tape as well. And this has two benefits. One, you've got that online backup in your office. If something happens to your major storage, your primary storage, you can work from or get at the data very quickly. And the second is, is it gives you a larger backup window. If you imagine that first environment of just disk to tape, if you're generating 10 terabytes of data every day and your tape system can only write at 300 megabytes per second, you are not going to be able to back up all of your stuff overnight. So when your users come in in the morning, you're probably gonna to have to stop your backup so your storage doesn't get flooded. By having the disk to disk to tape environment, you not only copy that data onto the storage system very quickly, you can work on it in an emergency in anger, but you've got a whole day to get that stuff off to tape before it starts to back up again the next night. So it's a lot of flexibility. And of course we can run disk to disk to cloud. 
So these systems are all there to protect the media workflow. And downtime is very, very painful in media environments. You know, if you have a disk and a tape system, if your disk system's offline and all you have is tape, you then have to replace that disk system, perhaps buy another one or get it up and running before you can even restore what you want to be able to work from. And at 300 megabytes a second, that could take a long time. So how much production are you down? At least with a disk to disk system, you can work from the, the second copy whilst you rebuild the original. So, you know, these are fundamental parts and they, they just make sense um, and they're imperative to workflow. So I'm going to hand over to Matt now so that he can start talking about Archive and how we work with that uh, and the key difference between what I've talked about and what Archive is. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Duncan. So let's move on. So I think I just want to reiterate uh, very quickly that you know, when we're talking about backup and archive, the real difference is going to be the length of retention of how long you need to protect and store these assets. A backup is going to be a short-term back is going to be a short-term copy that is designed to really protect you in the event of a calamity or some type of data loss and is going to be meant to protect your IP in the short term. An archive is really meant to back up and to protect and stable and put your finished projects in a very stable, stable, safe environment. This is going to be something that gives you the added benefit of also clearing off storage from your active editing uh, server so that you can continue on with new projects and always know that your created and finished projects are safe and generally accessible in the future. Now the question really becomes what are the different types of ways to do that and what are the benefits and the costs associated with that. And I would say that, you know, to it in a sense, an archive is really putting your data on a digital shelf, so to say. Now, the first thing that we should talk about here is that there are, the th in some ways, the same three types of archive as there are backup, disk, tape, and cloud. Now, when you're archiving to disk, generally, this is going to be the fastest access to your content. However, this tends to be the most costly to archive. and that's for a few reasons. First, the RAID sets are going to be, you know, a little more pricey than our other options. Also, they're going to need to be replaced approximately every five years because that's the generally accepted average life of an enterprise class hard drive. So you need to be aware of these things when you're there. And they're really good for frequently needed assets that need to be, you know, gone to again and again over time. Now with tape, clients are generally going to achieve the greatest immediate and overall cost savings on LTO tape, which is quite save, stable and designed to last for about 30 years, although really you should migrate to new tapes a little sooner than that just for safety and peace of mind. LTO tapes generally are priced very affordably. However, recovering your data from tape will take a long, the longest amount of time, and if you're doing a very large recovery, you will still need a lot of active editing storage to bring that onto. Now, with uh, uh, archiving to the cloud, this is the newest option. It's going to offer a mix of stability and affordability. And there are two types of clouds that we're going to discuss for today's purpose. The first is large publicly available services and also private clouds, uh, which uh, clients will create themselves, usually in a data center. With large public services like AWS, Azure, Wasabi, Backblaze, etc., you're going to gain the benefit of a dedicated team looking after your data and regularly migrating it onto new physical media so that it's always protected, always on certified in its lifespan media that it's being held on. However, the archiving and recovery process can take the longest amount of time and is dependent on all segments of the internet between your facility. And the, uh, and the cloud service running at speed. And they will only go as fast as the slowest link in that chain. For pricing, Cloud Archive often starts out quite affordable, but then the monthly costs very usually grow, and they're going to be based on the usage of how much storage you need. And they're also gonna be very often impacted by upload and egress costs. So over time, you will potentially pay more for the service with the added costs when you actually need to access your content. That said, this could also be viewed 
as the most safe and secure for the reason for the simple reason that a dedicated team is looking after the media for you and making sure that it's always safe and backed up. Now, these three strategies can be used on their own or in any combination to achieve the level of protection that your company needs. And we here at GB Labs are very happy to discuss these options with you and help you build and create a strategy that's the right fit for your company. We're also very happy to offer products to achieve these backup and archive goals that are going to work with your existing storage, whether they be from GB Labs or from another vendor. For Disk Archive, we offer Echo, our nearline server that offers an excellent combination of storage, uh, excuse me, of cost and storage density. For Tape Archive, we're going to offer Vault, which is our LTO solution that's going to allow you to write in either TAR or LTFS formats and create multiple tape copies simultaneously so that you can have your media stored in multiple locations for that added redundancy and redundancy of location. Then for clients who need ultimate uptime and cannot afford to be down because their uh, workflows are very, very heavy and their deadlines are immovable and must be met at all costs, we offer a service called Cloak DR. Now this is a technology which basically is going to allow you to have a mirrored failover server. And what that does is it means that we're going to have a full active real-time copy of all of your data in two different locations, two different sets of disks running concurrently with each other so that should something ever happen to your primary editing storage, in under two seconds, all those connections are going to fail over to the uh, redundant server and you're gonna be able to pick up and keep going from exactly where you were with just seconds of downtime. This is really key because it's different than most backups and archives in that the file paths will remain the same, so there will be no relinking necessary for your media. And it really does give you that ultimate uptime where, yes, there may be a slight hiccup in time, but you will be back up and running within seconds. And then to connect to the cloud, we offer a product called Unify Hub, which has just come to market this year after about two years of development. Now, Unify Hub is a fantastic program that allows you to connect your multiple servers within your facility directly with the cloud so that as you are setting your, your either your backups or your archive sets, you're going to be able to go directly from your storage pools within your facility straight to the cloud without needing to put a workstation in between them that can slow down and add cost to your, uh, to your workflow. So with that, let me turn it back over to Duncan to discuss some of our very specific technologies we've developed to make all of this work. Lovely, thank you, Matt. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. And just before we move off this slide, um, in the next slide, I'm gonna be talking about the software behind the technology or the technology behind the software, um, whichever way you want to play, um, whichever you want to talk about it. Um, but it's quite important to understand what I'm talking about and why. So we're gonna be talking about our tools and things like replication between your primary and your secondary. And one thing I want to add in here is that although we have a fantastic ecosystem, we are as a company and as always, always been as a company able to adapt and work with others. So if you're looking at this diagram and thinking, well, actually I have a customer or I do it myself have a SAN, we can place the primary storage as a SAN and we can still run our tools. We can still replicate from a SAN. We can still back up an archive onto our tool sets with a SAN. And we can still use Unify Hub inside the Echo 36 or with the appliance to share that SAN out to remote workers and things like that and integrate cloud. So it's vitally important to understand that these tools not only work with our environment, but actually work with third parties as well. And again, you might have our primary storage and our backup, but you have your own third party tape system. So you might have a large robot running alongside, as I said before, something like Press Store. Um, and that's your, your tape solution, which is absolutely fine because it can work with space, it can work with Echo, and it can work with FastNAS as well. So as we go through the tools, please bear that in mind that you know these tool sets are inside our product, but we can work with others. So you know, do talk to us if you want to find out how we can help. So as we move on, the technology. So with CoreOS, we have some key tools inside the box. And how are these used? Well, automation. So inside Core 4, we have automation, a watch folder environment. 
Now, this can be particularly useful, not only in your workflow in terms of perhaps having watch folders to upload out to playout servers or push to different parts of the network, perhaps other departments. In a backup role, automation can be used to perhaps take dailies onto your Echo, for example. It can then copy those to a cloud or to a third party storage and then push them into your online, whether that's a space or a SAN or something else. So by the time you'll start working on these live files, you know you've already got a copy somewhere, so you can you can work on them happily, not waiting for a copy to be done that night. Automation can also push out back out to cloud. It can FTP files to places. Um, it can share them in different environments. It can rename, and it can even be a go-between as well. So the next one is File Manager. So File Manager is a great tool inside the software, and it allows you to browse your storage inside your box but also it can link to other GB Lab storage systems on the network and your cloud providers. So for example, you can browse directly your Dropbox or your Wasabi or your AWS account inside our, inside our system and drag files up and down. The third tool built into CoreOS is replication. As I mentioned before, this was brought into being in around 2011 because the tools that we saw from other manufacturers or just using rsync and command line really just didn't cut it it just wasn't quick enough with replication it's multi-threaded we can deliver we can replicate with with tools checking file checking tools around a gigabyte per second it can get data from one of our storage systems to another incredibly fast but it will also work with external servers so we can use it to pull data from another storage system onto our echo perhaps push from our storage system onto another party for it to be the near line the second copy and also cloud, and also a go-between. If our server can see two different networks, we can pull from one server and push to another, and we can do the job. So it's a fantastic tool to do many, many things, including data migration on install. If we add into that our Unify, this is taking our cloud to the next level. So you've got additional providers, You've got cloud acceleration with cloud accounts being brought into the storage, meaning we can back up your cloud accounts. Maybe it's a playout server storage on the cloud or in a data center in your own private cloud. We can pull that through with Unify Hub and replication working together and then place that onto one of our storage systems. It also has the added benefit of remote workers as well to add into the pot. So it's a great piece of software to have add to your system. As Matt mentioned before, Cloak DR, a great license to add. Two servers, exactly the same. In its cruelest term, or in its crudest terms, if one goes bang, the other one takes over in two seconds, and no one really knows it's happened. Apart from the admins, you get the message, of course, but the users do not know that this happened, and they can carry on working. So very, 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 very reduced downtime. And finally, part of this tool set is bandwidth control with the addition of the dynamic settings on Core 4. So bandwidth control allows us to li limit the send and receive rates, limit the read and write rates inside our servers from client connected systems. But with the dynamic part, this is where we react to the priority queuing that has been applied. So if, for example, you have an edit system or edit systems that are high priority, if they happen to start working late at night on a project that has to be delivered the next day, then we can watch those and we can prioritize them. And if a replication is running or a backup tool is running, we can then slow that down or even stop it to ensure that those editors are protected and working hard. And when they stop, we can then bring that back up the queue again. So some really great tools within the software. So what do these come on? Well, if you've got a space or an echo with the full core four operating system, you have automation and replication and file manager, all as standard. You have the option for Unify Hub, the option for Cloak DR, and you've got dynamic bandwidth control. If you have a FastNAS, you get replication and file manager as standard, and you have the option to install Unify. Um, Cloak DR and dynamic bandwidth and automation are not available on the FastNAS range. Now, that being said, if you decide that you want to look at an F16 Nitro as your online because of the incredible performance and bang for buck of that product, you could go and get an Echo 16 and sit it as your near line, and then you get all the tools. So then you've got automation 
and you've got the dynamic bandwidth and things like that. So you can have watch folders on your Echo interacting with the Fastnas. So the best of both worlds in your solution. So we seem to have rushed through a little bit, so we've got plenty of time to have a chat and get some questions. So if you've got any questions, please send them in um, and we can have a good old discussion. We ran out of time in the morning because we're having some good chats. We mm -hmm. run over a little bit. So I'm going to move on to the question and answer page just so everyone is exactly sure where we are. Um, and we've got some questions coming in. So, oh, excellent. Let's have a look. What's the first question? Let's have a look. So what are the next steps for GB Labs in backup and archiving? Um, that's actually quite an interesting question. The, the tape is a great format and it's been around for a long time. Um, and of course, we're moving to LTO9 as well. Um, and you're getting huge amounts of capacity on those tapes. So we generally see that even now, having an on-site disk backup is incredibly important. But beyond that, we've got lots more integration coming with tape. We've got greater tape capacities, greater performance. Um, but we think there's going to be a real mix of tape and cloud, allowing people to, you know, the good thing about tape and uh, cloud, sorry, is that actually once your data's in the cloud, you can get it externally. You know, you can log in and get those archived files um, externally. Whereas with tape, you are limited to the physical aspects of the tape system. That is rather good. So, let me see. Sorry, I'm just going to try and click into these questions. My control panel is not allowing me to see the questions rather annoyingly. Here, Duncan, I can see one. Okay. What are the benefits of uh, backup and archive in corporate uh, versus educational environments? Excellent. Do you want to take that one? Sure. So, so um, having worked as a professor for quite a few years now in Los Angeles and also having assisted many corporate clients with their archive and storage needs, there really are different needs and backups between corporate and educational. With corporate, you're going to be going through creating projects and very often archiving them for a longer term storage and for retention, sometimes for legal reasons, sometimes just for corporate history reasons. With education, what we're finding is that many of the projects that we're archiving are gonna be for classes that are gonna come back around every so many terms. So when you're doing a class and you have a certain set of media that a class will be working with, whether it's in a communications course or a film course or some type yeah. of other media arts course, we'll see these uh, needs for specific class or for class specific media to need to be backed up and archived for long retention because they've you know obtained the rights to use this material but then they're going to bring it back with some frequency whether it be you know every six months every year two years whatever that may be with the corporate clients we're seeing a much wider disparity in what their archival needs are some projects are going to be done once they're going to go off to archive and they're going to just sit there uh, potentially for years on end and potentially might not come back unless there's some specific need other projects are going to come back uh, with some regularity, whether it be media that's used for an annual event or media that's going to be used for promotional reels or sizzle reels that the cor corporation needs to cut for themselves. So we're really seeing some disparity in the needs of what they are, both legally and in our um, reconstitution. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, um, it's quite interesting because the corporate markets, the corporate market, in my experience, is um, when they're talking to people about backup, we have a very famous um, client um, who has something to do with football or soccer, as you would say, <laughs> but a football team. And um, they had a massive installation of our product and their corporate side um, said, yep, that's fine. You can use our internal storage to back it up. You don't need mm -hmm. to go and buy an Echo. There's a complete waste of money. Yep. So they then proceeded to dump 100 terabytes of st stuff onto the corporate SAN. Um, and within three weeks, we had we were quoting for an echo because it was just unusable. Yeah. It made sense, mm -hmm. but it was unusable in media because within weeks they needed to pull back two terabytes. Right. And they had to submit a form, then it had to go for approval, then it had to be taken and put back on the storage, and then it was you know weeks to get the data. Um, so 
you know, an echo went in and they've got protection of their of their their workflow. So yeah, it does make sense, you know, corporates, especially you know, when it's full of Macs and they tend to go, oh, because they're full of Macs, you know. So right. they get left to their own devices. Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned that because in education we find that they're very, very Mac friendly. Hmm. We're seeing many of the students are Mac and have only been Mac, whereas in corporations we're seeing they're still very heavy, heavy PC users. Yeah, exactly. I mean, lucky for our customers and our partners, well, not only do we talk media, but we talk IT, so we do. We can have a chat with them as well. And it's also important to know that we're also friendly with Linux as well. Absolutely. We love Linux. Yeah. We're made on Linux. We do. Um, um, I see a question that just came in here. I was thinking about basic NAS for my backup to save a cost. What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, that's quite a good question. Uh, the, the thing, it's what I mentioned earlier, the thing about what we call for IT NAS or basic NAS or whatever, um, is that, yes, it's a good idea because of the cost, right? So you can go and buy a chassis from the internet or IT supply, you can fill it full of cheap disks and you can have your data somewhere. But it's when it when it becomes usable or unusable and that's the problem because in anger, if you've got 30 terabytes of data on your, I would say basic NAS, mm -hmm. you can get to it, but you can't work from it. So then you've got to copy it off, which means you then got multiple copies in places. Yeah. You know, there's a reason we have Echo. It's because backing up onto something else just didn't work for media. An Echo, although it doesn't have our performance charts, an Echo 36 will deliver sort of two, two and a half gigabytes a second. That's enough to, to edit and work from in, in anger. It's not designed for it, but it's quick enough to do it. And that's the real key. If something happens to your primary storage, You've got to be able to work from your secondary. Otherwise, apart from having a second copy, there's no real point. Mm -hmm. And actually, that leads on because another question has come in about a NAS solution. So the question has come in that they have an existing um, sort of IT-based NAS solution. There's no names um, on here that they haven't said who it is. And they think about moving to us. And they've asked how we can reuse it. So there's a backup. And that's a really good idea because one of the things about replication is the ability to be able to to go both ways. So if they've got an existing storage system, we can bring ours in, we can use replication to pull the data onto their storage, which in turn creates a backup they've not had before. Once the data's there, they can then switch that into their new online and start working from it. And with replication, we can recycle their old storage and push data back onto it as a copy. So in effect, they, they end up with that backup, we just reverse the roles. So yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. I see another question here that's come in. My team are all working remotely. How do these kinds of workflows benefit me? That's a really good question because over the last two years, I think pretty much the entire world has worked remotely at least at some point with their media workflows. And even today in Los Angeles, we've seen quite a few editors move out of the city into you know, very far flung places where they're now working remotely quite heavily and have no intention of moving back. This is a really good point in that any corporation is still going to be based on the value of their IP, and especially corporations, um, but also you know media and entertainment companies as well. The IP is the critical thing, and it must be protected at all costs. And we're still seeing that the on-premise server, which are very often still running, are going to be that place of truth where like the masters are first backed up to, where they're protected, where they're safe. And then as we're seeing editors working remotely, using you know, multiple different products, uh, in some cases, Unify Hub, which works mm. quite well, they can be taking their daily work and then bring it back or sending it back remotely to uh, the home server where it can then be archived so that there is still one central point of truth for the entire team to be working off of with the media and their organization. So I would say that even though things have gone remotely, media still needs to be protected and needs to be backed up. And then when projects are done, they do need to be archived in a way that's easy for them to be found and to be reconstituted. Yeah. And even if you are cutting, let's say, a 10-episode series and you have 10 editors in 10 different states, you know, five years from now, when you, you know, repurpose the series for sale to a different market, to a different location, uh, to a different streamer, streaming service, there are going to need to be some small changes need, and all that's going to need to come from one central location. So having a central archive is still extremely valuable for your IP. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've had a quick question in about LTO. Um, I've heard rumors that LTO is quite slow, so why would you recommend it? Um, <laughs> okay, well, fair enough. That, that's a good question. Well, yes, 
LTO can be slow. Now, you know, if you're writing an LTO 7 or an LTO, LTO tape, um, LTO 8, 8 tape, for example, requires 360 megabytes per second to write. Now, that is quite quick for a tape system, but it's nowhere as quick as a drive, like a Thunderbolt 2 drive, or in fact, a gigabyte per second when you're writing on Tor Echoes. Um, so yes, it is quite slow, but the other thing is the software as well. Um, when tape is writing, it has to be able to write the data at full speed. Otherwise, the tape has to stop and rewind and makes loads of noise and wears out the mechanism. And you know, wears out the tape too. It does wear out the tape. Yeah. So a lot of software, um, not just ours, but a lot of softwares actually compensate for this. And we've got something called Hyperwrite, which allows us to write any file of any size at full speed. So it does negate that, but you're still limited by that tape speed. Mm -hmm. And if you did have to bring back 20 terabytes or 30 terabytes because your online system has gone pop then that's a long time to wait to bring it back you know as an archive i think tape is fantastic because it's designed to last 30 years you'd want to recycle it after a few years so you've got you know less tapes as, as customers have done so as an archive i think it's a good format it's cost effective mm -hmm. it's affordable you can do two copies you can keep one in the office mm -hmm. you put one into storage um, but as a backup medium um, I think if you've got disk to disk to tape environment that we talked about earlier, then yes, it's probably quite valuable because you can you can afford to, to wait for it to do its job. Mm -hmm. If you're just doing disk and tape, I, I'm, I don't think it's probably the right solution. Um, you've got to allow that backup window. You do. Certainly with HyperWrite, we help with that. You know, it's still sure. chunters through. Then again, if you've got a vault and you put four drives in it, we can you know, we can archive 20 terabytes in around five hours. So it's it's quick with one of ours, but we can say that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when, when I'm talking to, to clients, one of the things I like to point out is that LTO is a portion of an intelligent archive and backup solution, and that you can have multiple formats running simultaneously yeah. so that all of your needs are met. There are going to be the immediate needs if you have a failure on an active project, but with LTO tape, it's going to be safe and secure for the long term and affordable to make multiple copies that you can then place in multiple locations to assure that your media is always accessible and always, you know, available for you. Hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, I think we're nearly at our time. Um, we've had one last question relating to SAN, and it goes, you mentioned SAN earlier, and I have one. How can Echo integrate? Um, very, very easily. So, of course, Echo being a full product has all the whole suite of tools. If you remember that um, that previous slide, which we can go back to, this slide here, you can see the Echo has all the tools at the top, automation, replication, and file manager. Um, so by us allowing our system to be able to see an SMB share on a SAN, for example, we can pull that data from the SAN with replication. We can automate data going back onto the SAN. So perhaps, as we mentioned earlier, the Echo or the Nearline could be a dumping ground for dailies, and then we make a copy somewhere else, keep a copy on the Echo, and then push it into the SAN. So you know you've got two copies automatically. Perhaps we push it onto another server or another environment. So yeah, if you've got a SAN, very easy to integrate. All we need is an SMB share, and we can do the rest. Um, and that's the same for a lot of storage platforms. An SMB share is all we need, and then we can take over and do some great jobs. So I think that's it. I think we're we're done for the day mm -hmm. so thank you very much matt and thank you for coming over here and i'm glad to see you've been to the supermarket and picked up a lot of english chocolate to Shh, enjoy <laughs> Don't tell anybody. um and um yeah great to have you here and uh, thank you for your time on this webinar it's been really interesting and keep an eye out we've got some more exciting ones coming up um mm -hmm. keep an eye on our feeds and if you have any questions about this or want to see these tools in action please reach out to our account managers um and our partners and we'll be very happy to to talk to you and help you further. So All right. there we go. Thank you for having me in your lovely country, and I look forward to seeing you out in LA sometime soon. Yes, well, I'm glad you've enjoyed some of our storms. It's been great. <laughs> it's been lovely. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, take care and stay safe.